Spirit, wherever or whenever you are hearing me this speak just now and sing together our opening hymn, number 323, Break Not the Circle, or follow along with the words that you'll see on the screen. Number 323, Break Not the Circle. the circle. Come wonder at this love which offers forgiveness, which embraces all. Come join this liberating community and experience the freedom of being held in unconditional love. That is our aspiration, but it takes all of us to make it so. So come be here with us now. Welcome. My name is Bill Gupton, and I'm the minister here at Heritage Universalist Unitarian Church, a congregation of love and freedom founded in 1827, seeking to grow and learn and widen the circle as we approach our third century as a community of faith. Today's service and the very interesting community conversation that will follow will offer viewpoints on changes taking place in our faith. We're glad that you have joined us this morning, whether you're here in the sanctuary or out in the Great Hall or with us on Zoom. Everybody turn around and wave at the camera. It's back there in the back corner. Hi, Zoom. We love you. Or maybe watching a recording of this service sometimes later on. Again, welcome everyone. For first time visitors, please sign our physical guest book here at the church or a, the virtual one, which will appear in your chat on the Zoom screen. And for those here today, if you have questions about Heritage, we encourage you to connect with a member of our Board of Trustees, Michelle Kelly. There's Michelle. Michelle would be happy to meet with you right after the service, show you around, answer any questions, and help you get connected. Now is a good time to silence any devices that you may have with you today. And then let me call your attention to the printed announcements in your order of service. Maybe you will find something in there also that will be of use to you, something colorful and small that might be of use to you later in a few minutes when our Director of Lifespan Faith Development, Lacey Adams, is speaking. There's also a calendar of church events on the back page of that program. And now let us open our hearts to worship and to the power of community as Russ Arujo reminds us why we are here as a gathered family of faith. In 2008, Heritage UU Church developed a mission and vision statement. It started with a process of inviting everyone in the congregation 
to provide their ideas, then having a group of people review those ideas for similarity and repeated themes, and finally, the writing of these words. We are here because we need each other for our hearts, minds, and spirits to grow, because our children need us for their own growth, and because the world needs our action for compassion and justice to grow. We are here to celebrate the mystery and wonder of life, to share our joys and sorrows, and to care for each other and the world at large. We are here to welcome people of all beliefs, to value diversity of all types, and to offer a safe place to explore all questions with honesty. With the strength that comes from community, we move forward with courage into the future, sharing our principles with an ever-widening circle of people until the world is infused with the values that are the special aspirations of our faith. Now please uh, rise and by your spirit once more and lift your voices as we sing our next hymn, which is not what it says in your order of service. <laughs> Instead, we will be singing number 318, We Would Be One. So if you're using your hymnal, 318. If you're using a screen, just read along. We Would Be One. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. There are many exciting things in your order of service today, in addition to all of the usual exciting things. Now, if you will look in your order of service, explore back behind the large pieces of paper, you will find some tiny, well, not tiny, some medium-sized pieces of paper. I would like for you to find the, your piece of paper 
and consider what it is that you are seeing. They look like this. They are this size. There's something on them, though. All right. Once you have found your object, I would like for you to consider what is this object that you have? Take it a second. Take a second. Okay. Would anyone be brave enough to tell me what you have on your piece of paper? Yes. Emmett? Let me see your let me see what you have. All right, here we go. Emmett has an anteater. Does anyone else have an anteater? Is everyone of the same accord that this is an anteater? No. No, okay. It's a rainbow flea. It's a rainbow flea. Does everyone have this anteater slash rainbow flea? No. No. Okay. What else is there? Yes. A butt. A butt. <laughs> Who has a butt? Do we generally think this could be a butt? Okay. This one might be solved. Might these two things be related? Uh, okay. We need more information. Scarlet. Oh, okay. Who has this? All right. Scarlet believes that this is a unicorn horn. This might be a good guess. I thought it was a French chip. Or a French chip. <laughs> <laughs> how, are the, how are these things related? Oh, no, we don't know yet. OK, Crosley, you have something back there. OK. Anyone has these objects? Rabbit ears. Any other thoughts? Lungs. Lungs. What was, say again? A boomerang. A boomerang. Okay. We're, we're not exactly sure what this is. Okay. Now thinking of these items together, something that might be ears for a rabbit. There could be a unicorn horn. We, we are all of agreement that this is the behind. <laughs> and we have no idea what this is. Okay. Who else has something that might help us figure this out? In the, a tail. Julie Kane has a tail. Do we feel like this is a tail? Everyone who has it? It's a swoop of hair or a mustache. It is some sort of hair, though, maybe. All right, what else are we missing? Legs. OK. So if these are legs and this is the, is the back end, we believe that this creature has four legs, potentially. Okay, we're, get, we're getting somewhere, right? Could be a unicorn horn. That would, that would work, right? Four legs, unicorn horn, okay. But there are these weird things we have. Anything else? Anything else that you see? Ellie? Well, this might pull it together. All right, let's see it. Oh! Okay, is this the face? Might we agree that this is the face? Okay, a face. So, what are these two things? Ears. Ears, maybe, and it's bangs. Okay, bangs. That'd be nice. Okay, now, now that we have potentially revealed, are there any other pieces that someone has? Now, considering what we have seen, what do we think this item is? Um, <laughs> Kate? All right, Kate thinks it's a unicorn. Who might support that supposition? All right, we're, 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 we're maybe at 50%. You are right, Kate. This is indeed a unicorn. Okay. There it is. Now that, we have, now that we have done this process of collectively engaging different parts of this unicorn, I hope this unicorn is a reminder to us that each of us has a vantage point 
and an experience. And when we see pieces of things, we interpret that based upon what we know, right? About the information that is provided to us. I think that the hair, the hair swoop is maybe the most interesting to me because I had never really considered until someone said it that this might look like an anteater. But the minute I said, they said it, I said, well, I'll be. That could be an anteater. Like here's its nose and it has that spiky bottom, this part here. It, mo it could be a rainbow armadillo, right? Tardigrade. 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 Each of us sees part of the world in which we live. Each of us stands in a particular place that gives us a particular set of images and sights that we have. This is the world that we see in front of us. And it is based, the sight, what we see, what we know, is partially determined by our frame of vision. Now, if this is my frame of vision, I am really only seeing a quarter of what is possible because there's all of this to be seen. Now, when someone stands in a different place, they give me other parts of the field of vision. If each of you didn't have something to contribute to this unicorn, we would have never solved it. So it is with anything. So it is with the power of community. We each have our piece. And it is important that we value the sight of the other so that we can see more fully the whole world before us. If we insist that our view is the only one, we might still be stuck here. We might have never gotten to the unicorn, but when we open ourselves to others' perspectives, their views, what they see, what is possible for them, and what their experiences are, well, then the world starts to open up to us. So this is, this is what we do as a community. And I hope that as we go forward for the rest of worship today and into our community conversation, that you will carry your piece of the unicorn into that conversation so we might remember that together we can make the whole vision possible. Now, for those of you who are, for our young people, we are actually gonna to leave together now and we're going to be meeting in the heritage room. So if you will follow me out as we sing, um, we're gonna, we are going to join in some uh, acts of collective democracy while everyone else is in worship. Now, I'm sure you've noticed that our music director, Les Tacey, is not with us this morning. We want to thank Sherry McCamley for filling in for Les today. Les is at home recuperating from successful uh, nasal surgery on Friday, but he is here with us in spirit as well as through the magic of pre-recorded video. Each week during this stewardship season, members of Heritage Church are sharing with us via video what community means to them and why they support our congregation. Today, it is Les Tacey's turn, so here's Les. Hi, my name is Lester Tacey. I'm the music director here at Heritage. What I like most about Heritage is the connection we have with the community here. And as I get older, it's really important for me and my wife, Steph, to have that kind of connection and that kind of community um, as we continue to live out our lives. So that's what's the most important to me here about Heritage. Thanks. Good morning. Good morning. So as Reverend Bill detailed for us two weeks ago, throughout our Unitarian Universalist history, both before the 1961 merger of the Unitarians and the Universalists and since, racism and anti-racism have run side by side. 
Now, both from the top down and from the bottom up, we you use are trying to address again systemic racism with special attention to within our faith tradition because black you use are asking that Unitarian Universalism finally live up to its promises. But with over 500 years of European colonialism in the Americas, it has proven extremely difficult to extricate the systems of laws, practices, thinking, and refusing to think that hold systemic racism and oppression in place even among liberal folks like you use and our institutions. So today I wanna to share with you what UU institutions are doing now and the pros and cons that we're hearing about those efforts. But first I wanna share with you a question I asked myself over 40 years ago as a budding Catholic social justice advocate who was protesting the wars in Central America. So here is my question. What does my faith have to tell me about these wars, I wondered. And I'm still asking, and today I'm asking you, what this same foundational question, what does our UU faith tell us about peace, about social justice, and in this moment about racism and oppression? This isn't a new question for Unitarian Universalists, but so far we haven't gotten it right. We have tried, like in 1997, the General Assembly voted to commit to intentionally becoming an anti-racist, anti-oppressive, multicultural institution. But those efforts that followed weren't sustained and the funding and the support started to wane in the 2000s. So are we on cue? Paula Cole Jones, thank you. Uh, a member of the Article II Study Commission, which for the most part now I'll just call the Study Commission, says that after working with congregations on these issues for 15 years, she realized that a person can believe they're a really good UU and follow the seven principles without having to think about or deal with racism and oppressions at the systemic level. So in 2013, she and Bruce Pollock Johnson drafted the eighth principle. They chose each word and phrase carefully to address what they felt was essential to move UUism forward as an anti-racist, anti-oppressive, multicultural uh, institution. So the eighth principle begins, like all of our principles do, with this same kind of prelude. We, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, covenant to affirm and promote. And then it goes on journeying towards spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. And Paula describes the eighth principle this way. It's a proposal to center our work around building inclusion into our spiritual life, into our congregational life, and into all of our practices. It is implied in the seven principles, she says, but we treat it more like social justice. So this is to move it from that social justice arena and make it central in terms of our spiritual development and our wholeness as human beings. At uh, General Assembly in 2017, the eighth principle was introduced as a responsive resolution and it passed overwhelmingly. And since that time, it's been adopted by at least 157 congregations for their individual congregations. It's been supported by Black Lives UU, by divorce congreg diverse congregations, and largely white congregations. And with this overwhelming support, it was time to take on the long overdue task required by our bylaws of re-examining all of our principles and the other elements of Article II. And you all got a handout that Article II is that two-sided sheet. Hopefully you got that. If not, I think there's still some back there. And by establishing the Article II Study Commission to do all of that reviewing and reimagining. So let's take four minutes, to be exact, to listen to a video by Cheryl M. Walker, who, was, who is a part of the Article II Study Commission. She's gonna explain it better than I can. I'm Cheryl M. Walker. I use Cheryl, they, she pronouns. I am a short 
black woman who is most definitely still maybe perhaps not middle-aged anymore, but I also have very short gray-ish hair. And I am coming to you from Wilmington, North Carolina. Many of you already know that Article 2 is where our principles and sources reside, but it contains more. It is also a statement outlining the primary purposes of the Unitarian Universalist Association of Congregations. Why does it exist? Our current statement says that the purpose of the UUA is to serve the needs of its member congregations, organize new congregations, extend and strengthen Unitarian Universalist institutions, and implement its principles. There is also an inclusion clause which articulates our commitment to being an association of congregations that truly welcome all persons and commit to st structuring congregational and associational life in ways that empower and enhance everyone's participation. Finally, Article 2 contains a freedom of belief clause, which affirms individual freedom of belief and the right of congregations to have their own covenants unless they are used as creedal tests. The Article 2 Study Commission has been charged with studying all of Article 2, not just the principles and sources. We are studying Article 2 now because there has not been a significant change to it in this century, which is longer than our bylaws require. While there were recently proposed changes to the principles and sources which did not pass, there has not been a complete review of the entirety of Article 2. The Board of Trustees, under the leadership of Alandria Williams and Reverend Mr. Barb Grieve, created our charge. Central to our charge is that we ground our work in love because it is a core value that we share. The Board also has given us a lot of freedom and directed us to be creative. And we have taken that seriously and have put everything on the table. We are encouraging you to think creatively about Article 2 as well. This is a time when we can shape the future of our faith. What an exciting time it is. So, What's important to know about the eighth principle at this time is that at General Assembly 2021, which was just last summer, they voted to recommend incorporating the eighth principle into the, any new revision of Article 2 that's now in process with the Study Commission. And at its outset, the Study Commission said this about the eighth principle. More than the language of the Eighth Principle itself, we are moved by the ongoing conversations about what it means to be accountable to each other and how we must, through our actions, take on the work of anti-racism and anti-oppression as an inextricable part of our Unitarian Universalist faith. And whatever flowers grow, the seeds sown by the Eighth Principle Project will surely bloom brightly. So it sounds like the eighth principle will be reflected in whatever comes through the study commission. So here at Heritage, we've agreed to engage not in the eighth principle itself, 
but in the study commission works, in the works of revising Article 2, of educating ourselves and our congregation, of holding conversations like we're going to have after this service, to understand and respond to the work of the study commission. And as Cheryl Walker said, in calling for the formation of the study commission, the Unitarian Universalist Board named love as a common theological core. They said, we assert that our deepest common theological grounding and value is love. It is what can and does motivate us and illuminates our deepest commitments to each other. So I hear two threads running through all of this. The first is the charge to do the hard interior work, individually and as institutions, to look at ourselves honestly and deeply, to find the sustained path toward anti-racism, anti-oppression, and multiculturalism. And the second is to do it because, at our core, we are rooted in love. And as Cornell West said, justice is what love looks like in public. We want a path to get us closer to that image. But due to many of the events of the past decade, perhaps from the murder of Trayvon Martin through the murder of George Floyd and beyond, white Americans have had a huge learning curve to begin to understand the power of systemic racism and how hard it is for many of us just to discuss it, let alone begin to try to dismantle it. I was looking for some statistics and I couldn't find any demographics past 2008 but we know that even as we work to become multicultural and diverse, you use are predominantly white. So that same learning curve applies to you use too. We are not immune. We too have to deal with white fragility and all the challenges that we face in looking at racism. The work we are doing is hard. Freedom as in the free and responsible search for truth and meaning, our fourth principle, has been a hallmark of our faith. And yet, when you lay the freedom of the individual alongside the core theological value of love, which by its very nature is relational, and which looks like racial justice in public, there's an inherent tension. And I think this might be the, one of the keys to the struggles we're having now the balance between the rights of the individual and the rights of the group and the well-being of the group has perhaps been one of humanity's oldest struggles. But I recently heard a minister talk about how she sometimes reads the principles. Now don't look now, but that sheet of paper you gave at the very beginning are our seven principles or they're inside your, um, your hymnals. She says she likes to read them from the seventh principle, the inherent worth and dignity, excuse me, the um, uh, the respect for the, uh, pause, say it for me. Respect, interdependent, of all life of which we are a part. She begins there with the interconnected web and she moves through the seven until she gets to the inherent worth and dignity of the person. It's a really interesting exercise and I find that it gives me a different perspective. It's going from the macro to the micro, from the earth community to the individual. No one is diminished and no one's left out, but it shifts the focus to the community that holds us all in relationship. So here at Heritage, since last March, the racial justice team has been proposing that we enter into this conversation, first about the eighth principle and now about the study commission in Article 2. And you may have noticed that in that time there have been at least two heirloom articles announcing the planned start of these conversations. But the pro process hasn't unfolded as I thought it might, um, and because not everyone agrees with me that the eighth principle is a no-brainer. And at first, I tended to dismiss those concerns, and I was really confident of my ongoing commitment. But as I listened more deeply to the voices here at Heritage that I respect and trust, I began to have more questions. So we'll be discussing the questions that have given me pause in what I call the teeter-totter part of my reflection. But for right now, let me close with this one thought. The one thing I know for certain is that this ship is already sailing, and there is a timeline coming.
There, good. There is a timeline that the Article II Study Commission has, as you can see, and we have a window of opportunity to tell them what we value through surveys. There's a survey on the website that goes through April 30th, and it's a really thoughtful survey. It makes you really think about what you believe. About community conversations, there's one right after this service. There's another one on April 24th. And any small discussion you might want to have in any group you're part of at Heritage. There are also ways to submit your answers to them, so it's not just idle conversation. We can tell them what's important. And then when our delegates go to GA in June of 23 and 24, they'll have the chance to vote for what we at Heritage tell them we value about what's being proposed. And I know for certain that change is a given. But for right now, let's take some time to pause and to pray and to continue our service. Please join me now in an attitude of prayer and meditation. These words are adapted from an article by UUA President Susan Frederick Gray and are used here with her permission. Spirit of life and source of love, help us to find the abiding compassion, grace, and solidarity to do the work of culture change to live into the anti-racist, anti-oppressive, multicultural practices of the beloved community. Let these practices be antidotes to perfectionism and paternalism that reinforce barriers and separation that pull us farther from the beloved community. And let us realize that the liberation we all need starts with centering the leadership and experiences of those, those most directly impacted by systemic racism and oppression. In these times, it is more important than ever to realize that we belong to each other and we share a responsibility for the conditions and qualities that define our relationships of interdependence across the globe and with our planet. May we continue to turn away from paternalism and toward the practices of humility, solidarity, compassion, and equity in fostering the beloved community in our culture, our tradition, and in our communities, and in the world. May it be so, and amen. Now let us have a sh time of shared silence. Amen.
Ours is also a religion of compassionate care for one another. One of the ways the love that is the spirit of this church is made manifest at Heritage is through our weekly ritual of candles of community. Here we lift up the joys and share the sorrows of our lives and are held in the loving embrace of this community. You were invited to email a joy or a sorrow ahead of the service, and I will begin by reading those and then move on to reading the joys and sorrows that were written in the candles book here in the sanctuary this morning. And then the chat function will be opened up in just a moment for those watching on Zoom who may also type in a joy or a sorrow. As I read each candle request, Louise will light a candle on our altar. First, the email requests. Seeing none from Zoom, we will now light one final candle for those joys and those sorrows that are unexpressed this morning but reside in our hearts. Thank you, Louise. And now our choir is going to sing a hymn that is very special to us at Heritage. Our former choir director, Clay Pendergrass, set the words of Barbara Brannon's poem, One Light Through Many Windows, to music. And to my knowledge, this sanctuary is the only place that this particular version of this hymn has ever been sung. We felt it was particularly appropriate for our topic this morning, uh, Clay Pendergrass's rendition of One Light Through Many Windows.
as has already been talked about here this morning in Unitarian Universalism, we pull inspiration from writings and practices of many religious and spiritual traditions in our personal and congregational search for truth and meaning. This calls us to respect the practices and beliefs of others when they create positive change and justice in our world. If one of our goals is to serve humankind in fellowship, as our covenant says, it is inspiring when we see other faith traditions making this a priority as well. So last Saturday, April 2nd, began Ramadan, a full month observed by Muslims worldwide with fasting, prayer, reflection, and community. So we're going to honor this faith tradition today by dedicating our offering to the Inner City Muslim Action Network. They operate on policy grounded in seven principles that read like a mashup of our UU principles and our heritage covenant. The success of their community revitalization work in Chicago led to the founding of an Atlanta chapter. Their staff and leaders include members of the communities they serve in order for decision making to directly relate to their specific wants and needs. They promote and support creative solutions and creativity in general with a focus on arts and culture. They promote community health with initiatives to bring healthy food options into food deserts and provide community clinics that support both physical and mental health. They also have a re-entry program that works with previously incarcerated individuals to provide transitional housing, life skills, education, and job skills that greatly reduce recidivism. You can learn more about their unique and specialized approach by visiting their website. And if you prefer a credit card donation, you can find their donate button and donate directly there. And our plate offering today for their work will be gratefully received. May our offerings serve the interdependent web of which we are a part. Okay. Right. Got to get to the part two. So now, let's take the next step together in examining what seems to be at stake with the Article II Study Commission. As I've said, I've been in full support of the Eighth Principle and the Study Commission, the work that they're doing. But there are voices we need to bring in. And listening to some of them is where this teeter-totter image that I've offered comes from. After feeling really pretty confident about what I thought, I started to feel a bit wobbly and lost my sense of balance a bit. 
So what are some of the arguments against the eighth principle and the potential changes that may be coming from the Article II Study Commission? So I'd like to share some of the concerns as I understand them um, about these two. So to start, some folks don't like the eighth principle because it isn't poetic. It doesn't flow like the words of the other principles. And some folks so love the seven principles rainbow connection that to change that to eight just doesn't work for them. <laughs> but but we, we have the, the sense that all of this is going to change with the reimagining that the study commission is doing. So I think we can not worry about that too much right now. Some people are concerned with the language of white supremacy that's being applied within our institutions. In a document called Widening the Circle of Concern that was also initiated in uh, 2017 at General Assembly, the Unitarian Universalist Association refers to white supremacy culture within the UUA. And I've heard people who feel that this is too extreme, that it's not true, and that it's really insulting. And I know that it's hard for white people to hear because we have images of what we think white supremacists look like. But insidiously embedded white supremacy is a different beast. And we are nowhere near extra extracting ourselves from its culture and its systems. The word accountable is a concern. How do you measure that and by whom? What would be the consequences for not complying? I asked about this at a study commission Zoom meeting, and they explained that accountable means responsible for each other or to each other, that we have obligations that are based on our covenants, that there are bonds that connect us as members of our faith, that, and that, that that requires actions to hold us in community. And I support that with all my heart, but I do hear the question about that rumored compliance requirement. And while there are voices weighing in on e these issues out there in cyberspace, there are a lot of naysayers on social media, those didn't trouble me so much. What threw my balance off was the folks here at Heritage who have different ideas that are troubling them. And those concerns come, uh, include several things that we believe are basic to Unitarian Universalist identity. So the future of the freedom of belief clause and possibly even the fourth principle seem to be in question. Now the fourth principle, I bet most of you could say it with me, a free and responsible search for truth and meaning uh, is a hallmark of Unitarian Universalism. And perhaps some folks think it's the most important. In this widening the circle of concern document, it suggests that this free search for truth is done within the boundaries of community. So we have to ask, is that a change from our longstanding understanding, or is it just an interpretation? So the freedom of belief clause, many of us are not as familiar with it. It's just in that article too, as uh, Cheryl mentioned. And it says in fairly legal language, nothing herein shall be deemed to infringe upon the individual freedom of belief, which is her inherent in the universalist and Unitarian heritages, or to conflict with any statement of purpose, covenant, or bond of union used by any congregation unless it is used as a creedal, uh, creedal test. So when I asked about that on the, Zoom, the Zooms of the study commission, about that rumor that it might be on the chopping block, they gave me a, a very reasonable explanation. They said that those words, especially that confusing part about the creedal test, that that came from the time of the merger and the language was really important to some of the universalists and that it's just not relevant. It came here kind of as a historic thing that we don't need anymore. And that may well be the truth, but what else might be lost if it's eliminated? There are two other elements of how we function together that are related to freedom, the loss of which some folks fear would fundamentally change Unitarian Universalism. They aren't contained in Article II, but there are a lot of changes happening everywhere. The freedom of the pulpit, which means that ministers can share their ideas and points of view uh, without any censure, whether officially or via the court of Twitter. 
and congregational polity, which means that congregations operate independently and the UUA can't tell a congregation what to do. The concern is that the language of accountability might override congregational polity by setting standards that have to be complied with. There is deep disagreement about these concerns, and that leads me to my own worries. I worry that we UUs don't have the critical listening and the conflict resolution skills that we need to facilitate our way through these challenges. I worry that we will devolve again into two divided camps. I worry that in arguing, the goal of centering the voices of black UUs will get lost once again. And I worry that fear of change will prevent us from creating something more whole and more holy than even what we have now. So my teeter-totter stance did get pretty unbalanced for a while because I felt like I needed to take a side. But we don't have to take sides. I can hold the truth of each person. I can listen. I can work to find common ground. And I can do my part. So what do we need going forward? Just the other day, I was rereading Blue, Black Lives UU's seven principles. They have a set for themselves. And among them are these three. Most directly affected people are experts at their own lives. Thriving instead of surviving. And experimentation and innovation must be built into our work. These values say to me that we need to center the voices of black UUs and others who often go unheard or are silenced. We need to be sure that everyone is thriving. And we need to be visionary and creative to move us into a future of Unitarian Universalism that will be a prophetic voice for ourselves and for the world at large. So I have a new question to ask now. What is mine to do? And I offer you this suggestion as you too work through these issues. My to do is to be involved, to add my voice to the conversation. The Article II Study Commission assures us that at this point, Nothing's been written or decided. And they have given us tools, the surveys, the community conversations, discussions. Uh, there are lots of YouTube videos. You can listen to the online sessions they've done that I referred to. And we can use those to tell them what we value and what we want our Unitarian Universalism to look like going into the future. So I'm going to close with this last image because it grounds me when I feel like I've lost my balance. It's a refrigerator, my friend, a refrigerator magnet my friend Susan gave me. And it reminds me daily that the answer is still and again, love. love. So let's take a deep breath. And maybe another. And join with me in a spirit of prayer. This is a prayer that Reverend Bill offered last or two weeks ago um, by Reverend Connie Simon at First Church. And I think it's as fitting today as it was two weeks ago. And I think maybe we will continue to come back to it, at least I will. Spirit of life and love, God of many names, we gather in awareness of the opportunity before us as Unitarian Universalists. We have been given many chances before today to heal the wounds of racism and oppression that have beset our denomination for many years and held us back from realizing the inherent worth and dignity of all Unitarian Universalists. We have made some progress, but we still have a long way to go. We have an opportunity today to renew our commitment to this work and to embrace it fully and thankfully we come together to listen to the voices of those whose con contributions to our faith have been neglected far too long. We welcome them home into a new Unitarian Universalism, into a faith that embraces and includes us all and brings us closer to the beloved community of which we dream. We know we have much work to do, that everyone has a role to play if we are to live fully into our principles and achieve our highest aspirations. We pray for healing of the wounds of the past and the present. We pray for open hearts and minds that we may envision what's possible. 
We pray for the courage not only to speak up, but also to listen, even when the words are hard to hear. We pray for compassion and understanding. We pray for resilience and determination and for the fearlessness to take risks, to make mistakes, and to try again. In gratitude for the opportunities we have been given and the promise we, of what we can achieve together, and in the name of all that is holy, together we say, Amen. Amen, Connie, and thank you, Louise. We do have much work before us, and it will sometimes be difficult, challenging work. But if we do it in the spirit of love, a spirit that we are practiced in using, I believe we will be fine. On behalf of Louise and the racial justice team at Heritage, I invite you to stick around after this service for a community conversation that will allow us to move deeper into this work and to hear from other voices and viewpoints. The Zoom room will stay open so folks on Zoom can also uh, see and hear what we're saying here and can chat in with us as well. Now, whether you stay for the community conversation or not, there are many other ways to get involved and to make your voice heard. On the home page of our website, huc.net, there are two links one to a survey that uh, Louise alluded to that's being conducted by the Article II Study Commission, which you're asked to complete by the end of this month. That's a direct survey for your thoughts to the UUA. And uh, there's another link to a short list of questions that are thoughtful prompts, if you will, to consider regarding this work of change within Unitarian Universalism. We will refer back to those prompts and use those prompts together as a congregation at our next community conversation in two weeks. So you can consider that your homework assignment for two weeks from now. I also have one homework assignment to give those of you who are willing to take it up for next week, which is Easter. Wear your Easter hats if you're at all comfortable with Easter hats. Lacey's going to wear her Easter hat. Lacey doesn't want to be the only person with an Easter hat. <laughs> That's your homework assignment for next week. And now for the closing words. As we embark on this journey, I ask you to hear the voice of Unitarian Universalist minister and educator Rebecca Parker. Let us covenant with one another to keep faith with the source of life, knowing that we are not our own, that earth made us. Let us covenant with one another to keep faith with the community of resistance, never forgetting that life can be saved from that which threatens it, saved even by small bands of people choosing to put into practice an alternative way of life. And let us covenant with one another to seek an ever deeper awareness of that which springs up inwardly in each of us. Because even when our hearts are broken by our own failure, or the failure of others. Even when we have done all that we can and life is still broken, there is a universal love that has never broken faith with us and never will. This is the ground of our hope and the reason we can be so bold in seeking to fulfill the promise of our faith and our values. Blessed be my friends, Ashe and Amen. Now, if you're here in the sanctuary, Please rise now and body your spirit for the final portion of our service. And wherever you are, whenever you are, please sing along with us this morning's closing hymn, number 145, as Tranquil Streams.
So will you all gather around the circle of the church as we prepare to share our benediction. May the spirit of life, May the spirit of life that, each of us possesses, that each of us possesses flow from one to the other. Flow from one to the other. May it stay with us. May it stay with us. And bring us peace and harmony. And bring us peace and harmony. Until we meet again. Until we meet again.